Hey, it's Jam and James Riley, and on the phone, the gentleman responsible for this great new documentary. It's a rockabilly world. Uh, we've got director Brent Huff and producer Patrick Stack. Uh, welcome to the Rockabilly and Blues Radio Hour, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask this of both of you guys. I, I, I want to get a little bit of a background on uh, just some things that you've done in the past so our listeners can uh, get to know you a little bit better. We'll start with uh, Brent Huff. We'll put him on the, uh, the hot seat first. Just tell us a little bit about... Uh, uh, your background, uh, where you live at these days. We'll, we'll get to Patrick as well here in a moment. Well, I'm originally from Missouri, but I moved out to Los Angeles over 25 years ago to be an actor. Uh, I was doing pretty well as an actor, but I wasn't getting a lot of the scripts that I wanted to do, so I decided to write my own script. And I got a uh, actor named James Brolin to help me uh, produce my first movie as a director and writer, so I sort of took off from there. And I've been doing mostly uh, scripted features as a director for the last 20 years. And then three years ago, I did my first documentary about uh, the ugly side of the modeling business called Chasing Beauty. And uh, it came out and it did really well on uh, iTunes and Netflix. And the second documentary was Behind the Orange Curtain, which sort of illuminates the uh, prescription drug abuse among uh, rich teenagers in Orange County, California. And it's uh, a lot of these kids are you know, taking Oxycontin and a drug called Opana, and they're overdosing. So it's a really, you know, sad thing. So it's two kind of complete different documentaries. And um, a couple of years ago, Pat Stack, who's the producer, and Pat and I have done two movies together that he produced and I wrote and direct. One was called Cat City, a film North Thriller, and one was Welcome to Paradise, sort of a faith-based film. And but Pat took me to a rockabilly event in Ventura, California, because Pat really likes the music. He's way, you know, really knows the rockabilly music, and I didn't know anything about rockabilly. But what fascinated me was the, this cast of colorful characters in the rockabilly world. So it wasn't just the great musicians and the guitar players and slap bass and snare drum, but it was the uh, the car culture. It was the pinup girls. It was the tattoos. It was the style, the fifty style, the pomade hair that the guys had. It was a show, and uh, it's this really great subculture that I wanted to learn more about and uh, sort of you know pry into, pull the curtain back on that. And that's sort of the impetus of um, uh, it's a rockabilly world for me. That's cool. Well, Patrick, tell us a little bit about uh, your background, and then we'll jump into this great documentary. Yeah, like Brent, I came out to, to California. I came out here in about 1980, actually from the East Coast. Nathan Lane and I were a comedy team, and we had been in New York for about three years, and I signed with William Morris, and they said, you want to come out to California and get exposure. And we had developed a comedy team to get exposure with actors. And we came out, and that lasted about another three years. We had a, a lot of fun work. We opened for people like Air Supply and Al Jarreau and Eddie Rabbit, and we did all the TV shows. But he wanted to get back to New York. I thought there was more opportunity for me here in L.A. I continued to pursue an acting career until about 1990. I had done some films like Rambo, First Blood, and FX, and TV, and commercials, and things like that. But... It was not as satisfying as I had hoped. I wanted to raise a family. I wanted to get married and have kids. Didn't want to live in a car, so I thought I ought to get a real job. And I got into ad sales. One thing led to another. I got into the Internet very early on. I sold the first ads on Yahoo in 1995, which was, was pretty interesting and pretty heady times. So after many, many years, I'll say five years of 16 to 18 hour days and being burned out. I kind of took what money I had from Yahoo and left and decided I wanted to get back into entertainment and be a producer. And I got an office for myself at Sony Pictures and started optioning some scripts. And one of the scripts I optioned was Welcome to Paradise. Actually, it was called The Glory Forever at the time, written by Brent Huff and William Shockley. And it turns out Brent and I kind of peripherally knew each other over the years through basketball. A couple of friends of ours used to run these games. And anyway, I, uh, I decided that that was going to be the first film that I produced, which we did. And as Brent mentioned, we did another one together as a feature film. And I've always enjoyed rockabilly music and the scene is wild. 
And documentaries are a little bit easier to get your arms around in terms of production. You don't need as much money. You don't need as much prep. You don't need a lot of stuff. You can go out with a camera and a good idea and with a lot of sweat equity, you can come back with a movie. And that appealed to me as it obviously has to Brent. So here we are two years after starting this venture, about ready to start sending our movie out. And that movie, of course, is It's a Rockabilly World. Brent, you said you weren't familiar with Rockabilly and Patrick, you were. You know, when you guys were digging into this, yeah, that, did you... That's interesting. I come from Philadelphia, Brentson, Missouri, and he had never heard of Rockabilly. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Well, now, did... Uh... I heard of it. I didn't know much about the, the culture. And I knew, you know, the stray cat from Rockabilly, and I knew the hairstyle. Yeah. But that's basically it, you know. And uh, I didn't, what, didn't even know, like, Elvis or... Carl Perkins, that was kind of rockabilly. I didn't know. I, more hillbilly where I grew up. Yeah. Down Once you guys started getting into this, did your opinions change of, of maybe what you thought, Patrick, or like what you thought you knew of rockabilly? And Britton, you, you definitely said this kind of opened up a, a new world to you. Uh, but were things changed a little bit once you guys started getting into this? I, I, I was just going to say, again, I had always been a fan of the music, but prior to inviting Brent up to this Johnny Cash revival show in Ventura, California, I had gone to a couple of other rockabilly shows because of all the people in this space, my favorite contemporary, and at least in terms of still playing now, has always been Robert Gordon. And I used to see him perform quite a bit at the Lone Star Cafe in New York, where I worked as a bartender for a number of years. And when he would come out to California to play these shows, I would like to go. And again, I, I, I was so taken aback by the look and the feel of all rockabilly. Again, the music was one thing, but as, but as Brent mentioned, when you go to these shows and you see the people that are all in, I mean, this is the way they dress and act and the cars they drive. I thought that was pretty cool. So that was a big eye opener once we really, for me, once we got into this, talking to people who are who are in the life, so to speak. That's true. I mean, there are people, and we've talked about this. I got to spend some time with both of you guys at uh, Viva Las Vegas in April. And there are people that are all in uh, with the, the, the hair and the, the clothes and cars and everything else. And then there's people that are just parts of it, you know, but uh, you know, music is kind of the thread through most of the different uh, lifestyles and stuff. Uh, Brent, what, what was most eye-opening for you? It was sort of how all these different aspects of the rockabilly world come together. The music, like you say, is the driving force. So that comes. But I don't know that these events would be near as big if there wasn't the car clubs. Yeah. And by most the car clubs, it's uh, mostly Hispanic, and they seem to love the music. And then there's the pinup girls. And we have all three of them together, it makes for a great event. So it's just these different aspects of rockabilly. And then there's the psychobilly, which I'd never heard of before. Yeah, that's and true. The people that are in the punk culture went over to psychobilly. The people... Or it's all inclusive. They let you know they're really friendly. And it's a good time. It's a party group. It's mostly um, alcohol, perhaps blue ribbon. Yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> uh, and then there's you go there and you get your hair. You get the you know pomade in your hair for a guy. You get the high and tight or the shark fin. You know you have to have, have your jeans. You have to dress a certain way. You know you can't wear Wranglers or shorts. You got to have the you know the device cuffed and you know the boots or the converse and I just found it fascinating. It's sort of like you know with bodybuilders has their own subculture, the Trekkies have their own subculture, the people who are into dolls and go to doll conventions have their own subculture, and subcultures in general fascinate me. So this was just these people are cool with. And uh, one of the things with, with, we talk to a lot of pinup girls, and it gives them a lot of confidence. You can even be, it, you can be any shape, any size, and feel sexy and dress up, and it's a costume party. And, and it, you know, we, a lot of girls say in the movie it turns a lot of heads, and girls like to turn heads, and it absolutely does. And the guys, you know, they have to be put together. It's a costume party. You know, you were, uh, James, we met you in Las Vegas. You saw it. It's, a, it's like a huge costume party with uh, music, cars, pinups, and tattoos as a backdrop. It is, you know, f for some people that, that it is a, an all-inclusive thing, it's just an extension of their world uh but then i think there's a huge part of it that it is a bit of an escape from reality it's a it's a comfortable mm -hmm. uh, escape from reality for a lot of people as well too but you're right it is very much a a, a dress-up event 
And then he'd let him talk. Did he still say, hey, daddy-o? And that was the, <laughs> you know, like the 50s. And we talked to a lot that said they really felt that they were born in the wrong era, that they should have been around in the 50s. Yeah. It was, a, uh, it was a better time. I've, I've felt that way about myself a lot of times, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. you weren't able to make it out to your favorite festival this year. Or you forgot to buy your favorite band's t-shirt and concert. Or you just can't get enough of cool merchandise from the rockabilly scene. Rocking Merch is the place for you. The official online store for Viva Las Vegas Rockabilly Weekend. As well as pomade, CDs, records, DVDs, and other merchandise from some of your favorite rockabilly artists. Find them online at rockingmerch.com. It's your one-stop shop for all your rockabilly needs. Hey, this is Jam and James Riley, and just a moment ago we heard Switchblade 3 with Treat Her Right. That's a tune featured in the upcoming documentary, It's a Rockabilly World, from that documentary film. Uh, Director Brent Huff and producer Pat Stack are our guests this hour. Now, Patrick, you mentioned Robert Gordon, and you know, we've talked about like the late '70s being a rockabilly revival of of Robert Gordon and, and stuff that led into uh, you know, Levi and the Rock Hats and uh, the Pole Cats and Stray Cats and uh, even the Blasters. You know, stuff that kind of came out of that movement. It really was pretty much all about the music at that point. Um, the rockabilly revival these days, like you guys have mentioned, is as equally big on the car scene, equally big on the pinup uh, scene as well, too. But they all do kind of connect, which is an interesting thing. Yeah, I, I think there are those people under the umbrella of rockabilly, and I call it an umbrella because of those three elements, and then add the tattoos, something that's, that's Absolutely. also part yeah. of, of the culture now. And there might be some safety in numbers, and I think you probably have purists in each camp 
Yeah. That really want nothing to do with the other folks, but in the spirit of a lot of people getting together and celebrating the music and the life and everything that went into living in the 1950s, or at least what they think is about living in the 1950s. You, you, you have these groups, again, all under, under the circus stand of rockabilly. But we have a girl in our a pinup and Elvis impersonator in our film who talks about what she calls the silly billies. They are, in her words, the posers, not the ones that are all.